was at Cornell University as head of the nutrition program there for about 15 years. But I have migrated the past couple weeks to Texas A&M to this position. And I will tell you that Texas has the vision of being a model for maybe the United States and maybe the world on how to transform agriculture to support human health. So I'm very excited about this position and you'll be hearing more from us later about that. Uh, those are my disclosures. And so I'd like to start this talk by asking the question that Nature asked back in 2010, and that is, can science feed the world? And of course, this issue dealt with the reality that by 2050, there's going to be 9 to 10 billion people on this planet, and are we going to be able to feed them? But what I always found ironic about this issue here is there is an article here on diabetes as well. And it seems to me the real challenge is, is not can we feed the world, because I think there's a lot of evidence that we can meet that challenge, but are we going to be doing it without having diabetes on the cover of nature? And that raises the question, really, what should we expect from the food supply? Because we do have an amazing capability of engineering the food supply now to be anything we want. We have various tools in our tool bag, but the question is, what do we want from the food supply? What do we want from our nutrient recommendations? What do we expect? Do we expect nutritional status to, to have adequate nutritional status and to avoid deficiency? Or are we going to try to optimize metabolic or other types of functions? Are we going to try to prevent chronic disease? Are we going to try to manage chronic disease? What do we expect from the food supply and what is actually achievable with the science we have today? Well, this past summer, the National Academy of Sciences in the United States actually spoke to this issue with a framework report that came out called Developing Dietary Guidance Intakes Based on Chronic Disease. And in fact, there have been studies very recently within the past year showing that in the United States, diet-related chronic disease costs the U.S. economy about a trillion dollars a year. And so it's not surprising that the federal government went to the National Academies and said, well, if that's true, why don't we then set our dietary and nutrient recommendations based on chronic disease prevention and save these health care costs that nobody can afford? And this is a remarkable report. I did have the privilege of being on this consensus panel. But now in the United States, when we do set the RDAs and the other dietary reference intakes, the first priority is going to be to try to set those based on chronic disease endpoints. And quite frankly, we don't have the data for very many nutrients to do this. And why is that? Well, first of all, chronic diseases are complex traits. They're not only affected by diet, but they're affected by age, genetics, epigenetics, environment, and a host of other factors. So diet is just one component that, in fact, um, you know, is associated with risk for chronic disease. Secondly, few chronic diseases are affected by single nutrients or single pathways. Rather, they are system failures. And so we have to understand system networks over pathways. And of course, systems have multiple nutrients that interact. So you can't consider one nutrient in isolation in this framework. Finally, or for, furthermore, we have to establish system readouts as biomarkers, these integrative biomarkers, as opposed to individual nutrient biomarkers if you're going to set chronic disease endpoints, which means you really have to consider DRIs as ranges rather than just point estimates, which this report also recommends. You have to look at a, the range of effectiveness. You have to understand biomarkers of aging and system decay. Aging is one of the um, more, you know, penetrant, if you will, risk factors for chronic disease. And if you live long enough, you will get chronic disease. So the question is, how does nutrition then affect that chronic disease trajectory to try to lengthen that trajectory as most of you can and to soften it as much as you can in terms of impact? And then finally, the report recommends grade standards of evidence. Nutrition is a field that relies heavily on observational data. This report recommends that you use the grade standards, which means you need 
randomized clinical trials, or if you have observational data, there has to be strong dose dependence within that data. So how did we get here? I want to start with a very quick story um, about neural tube defect prevention. So many of you may or may not be aware that neural tube defects are a common, and they're common in that birth defects are rare, relatively rare, but neural tube defects are one of the more common congenital anomalies at birth. This is the rates. In developing countries, it's much higher. The recurrence rate is much higher, telling you, in fact, that there is a genetic component to neural tube defect risk as well as an environmental component. And this is a real public health success story, where in the 1960s there were these clinical observations that mothers who gave birth to an affected child had biomarkers indicated, in, indicative of impaired folate metabolism. This led to clinical trials where moms were supplemented with folic acid, and in fact in all of these trials except one, you saw a reduction in neural tube defect frequency in the range of 72 to 75 percent. This led to recommendations for pregnant women to consume folic acid before they were pregnant, and then led in the U.S. and Canada to fortification of the U.S. food supply, rather, whoops, to fortification of the food supply with folic acid at this level. And since then, we've been in an evaluation phase, and in fact, in every country where there has been a folic acid fortification program, you have seen relatively dramatic reductions in the frequency or the occurrence of this birth defect. The, percent, the degree of percent decline really depends on what folic acid or the folate status in the population was prior to the intervention. So this is a real success story starting from early clinical observations all the way through to a food fortification initiative that was effective. However, if you look worldwide, many other countries, I'm sorry, many other countries here shown in dark blue here do have mandatory folic acid fortification programs. Those in light blue have voluntary fortification programs. But if you notice in Europe and some other countries, they don't fortify the food supply with folic acid despite the unequivocal evidence, in fact, that it does lead to prevention of the majority of these defects. And you see there in Europe, there's very little fortification going on. So why is that? And this relates directly to this issue of using food as medicine, in a sense, or using food to prevent a chronic disease, if you will, or at least, in this case, the rare disorder of the birth defect. Um, so countries that don't fort fortify, some of the reasons you hear why they don't, first of all, this was the first fortification initiative that really sought a medicinal purpose from the food supply. That is, the endpoint was to prevent a rare disorder. So you're using a disease endpoint. But some of the concerns that have been raised is, number one, while there is no established risk that for folic acid fortification in terms of pop population harm, there is some concern that this fortification initiative exposes everyone, but only targets a small subgroup of the population. That is women, women of childbearing years, women of childbearing years who are genetically susceptible to having a birth defect. So this is adding extra folate to target a group that is genetically sensitized that we can't identify. So it raises the question, well, there's a small group who benefits, and in the U.S. it's about 2,500 a year. Are there others who are accruing risk? It's also exacerbated, the concern is, by the fact that we don't know the mechanism of how folate prevents neural tube defects even today. And we know that there is a folate cancer relationship. Many chemotherapy drugs are antifolates. So there is this biological premise, well, then adding more folate may promote cancer. But again, there's no grade level one evidence, in fact, that folic acid fortification in any way affects a um, cancer in any respect. Um, there are observational studies that there is risk of high folate and low B12 status on various neurological and cognitive outcomes. But again, that data is not very strong. And there's some concern that there may be some biological activity of unmetabolized folic acid, but that hasn't been borne out yet either. 
But the bottom line is, is there is not a lot of uncertainty in some countries. And this results, again, because we know that there was a clinical trial that folic acid prevented the neural tube defect. We don't know why, so we really can't anticipate any unintended consequences. So that brings us back again to the challenge of using these sort of medical endpoints to set any sort of nutrient recommendation. And I want to dig into this a little bit more in really examining um, chronic diseases as complex traits and looking first at this interaction between diet and genetics. So this was a mouse study that was published just a few months ago in genetics where they took different mouse strains. So this is a clinical trial, if you will, using mice strains. And they used four different inbred mouse strains that are all, each strain is genetically identical, but these are all different. And they put them on one of four different diets for their lifetime and let them age out. And they measured all sorts of biomarkers for each of these strains on these different diets. They also looked at the aging of the genome. They looked at epigenetic decay. They looked at mutations in the genome. And what they found, in fact, is that if you look at these four mouse strains placed on either an American diet, a Mediterranean diet, a ketogenic or Maasai diet, and a Japanese diet, different strains optimized two different diets depending on what your outcome of interest was or whatever your surrogate marker of chronic disease was. You couldn't say that one single diet was optimized for any one genetic strain. They were all different. So this really gets into the challenge of using any sort of dietary recommendations or nutrient recommendation for a chronic disease prevention because you have to be able to classify various individuals to the right nutrient inputs. And so classification becomes key. And then you have to really decide what is the key outcome of interest that you're trying to optimize. And so that, again, shows you the challenge, then, of trying to use food and nutrients to prevent chronic disease. And in fact, if you look a couple of years ago, the American Society for Nutrition put forward its research roadmap. And the number one priority was to understand the variability in responses to diet and food such as what we just saw with the various mouse strains. This was repeated in last year in the National Nutrition Road Research Roadmap by the US federal government. And this is the interagency committee that includes all the federal funders of uh, nutrition research. But their question one in terms of high priority questions was how can we better understand and define eating patterns to improve and sustain health? How do we enhance our understanding of the role of nutrition in both health promotion and disease prevention and treatment? Again, using food with clinical outcomes. And number two, how do we understand our understanding of, or how do we enhance our understanding of individual difference in nutritional status and variability in response to diet? That is, how do we classify people and then put them or give them the right dietary and nutrient exposures to prevent disease? So this is a high topic or a, or a high priority area of research in the US. So now I want to look at another aspect here, and that is in terms of chronic diseases as complex traits, and look at the interaction between diet and epigenetics. And again, I want to focus just on some of the randomized controlled trials that were done, this one in humans. But what we do know is that chronic disease risk, when does that initiate? And there's more and more evidence that it initiates right from conception or even before that. So risk for chronic disease can initiate at the very earliest stages of life and progress throughout life. And for many chronic diseases, nutrition may modify the course but may not prevent. And again, the reason we say that is for many diet-related chronic disease, age is actually the biggest risk factor for um, that disease. And so we have to use diet to try to prevent the onset or severity of that disease. And of course, this idea comes from the developmental origins of disease hypothesis, where fetal environment exposures, especially nutrition, act in early life to program risk for adult health outcomes. That is, early nutritional exposures program or imprint some sort of a risk phenotype that then later leads to disease. <clears throat> 
We now understand this now with the advent of stem cell biology, that stem cells are very good at sensing the nutrient environment and exposures and then modifying their gene expression and adapting all of their cell cellular physiology to that nutrient exposure. But once those stem cells differentiate, you lock in whatever the state of that networker system is. And this is done by modifying chromatin, both DNA and histones, that really set up what the patterns of gene expression are going to be in response to, again, these nutrient exposures. So there was a study done a few years ago by my colleague uh, Marie Caldell at Cornell where she wanted to study optimal choline intakes during pregnancy. And we know that choline is one of those nutrients found in these food sources here that supplies methyl groups that go to methylate DNA and methylate histones that then set to wire these biological networks um, that then can have a lifelong impact on what your metabolic capacity is for various pathways. And so she did a randomized control trial where she supplemented moms either with the current recommendation for choline, the AI, or twice that level of choline, and wanted to ask the question, does that affect the infant's cortisol levels? There had been evidence, in fact, in animals that this is the case, that choline is one of those nutrients that cells sense and then program the genome accordingly with lifelong consequences. So moms were, were given choline daily in juice as choline chloride, either the AI or two times the AI, and then cortisol levels were examined in the children. And in fact, this was quite remarkable here because if you looked at cord plasma cortisol, you saw the group that got the AI had an average cortisol levels of about 32, and you had about a third reduction in those who had twice the AI for choline. And these levels of choline persisted for months and now years in these children. Now, cortisol is associated, is a biomarker and a risk factor for hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and depression. So these children that have the lowest, that have the lower levels of basal cortisol would be expected to be protected against uh, these metabolic disruptions, this metabolic disease. And low cortisol is also associated with increased uh, memory learning and attention. And this was published back in 2012. They've been following these kids and just published recently in the FASA journal now, looking at, uh, in, at infant processing speed. What they find again is that the kids who received the higher level of choline had higher levels of infant processing speed, and there seemed to be a dose dependence to that. I can tell you now they're following these kids at five years of age, and again, these sorts of positive effects are still holding. So in fact, we see that maternal nutrition, very early during gestation, plays a powerful role in regulating not only your risk for future metabolic disease, but also um, cognitive function as well. But what we also know is that as you age, these epigenetic landscapes that, again, that are set very early in embryonic development decay with age. And that is, you program your genes to express a certain amount of RNA and protein, but as you age, these patterns, these epigenetic patterns decay, leading to different levels of transcription leading then to really an altered chromatin state, and you begin to see decay of these various metabolic and other physiological networks that decay with age. And so one of the questions is if you're going to use nutrition again to prevent chronic disease, because chronic disease is associated with decay of these networks, can nutrition reverse or at least slow this decay in these epigenetic landscapes? And that's very much an open question. But some studies have been done, and this was published in Nature Reviews, showing if you look at the relationship between your biological age and your chronological age, what you find is people who remain healthy as they age, that is, they have a lower chronological age than their biological age, tend to retain these epigenetic landscapes. They don't decay as quickly and whether diet plays a role in this decay of these epigenetic landscapes as one ages through adult stem cells is still an open question. <laughs>
But not only do we want to set, though, again, our dietary recommend recommendations and dietary patterns to prevent chronic disease, age-related chronic disease, we also want to be able to manage chronic disease once it is established. And next week at the National Academy of Sciences, there is going to be a workshop around examining special nutritional requirements in disease states. Um, so this will be held next week. But currently, there really is no framework for setting guidance for what nutrient requirements are in disease. But what we do know is that once disease is established, it can affect whole body nutrient status as well as tissue-specific nutrient status. And this slide here was inspired by Victor Herbert, who published this back in 1972, not exactly in this form. But we know that once disease does take hold, through the process of, processes of inflammation, genetics, autoimmunity, mitochondrial dysfunction, the pharmaceuticals that are treating the disease and trauma, it affects both nutrient status and nutrient function. That is, disease itself can affect gut absorption of nutrients. It can affect transport of nutrient across barriers, the brain, the gut, the nerve barriers. It can cause increased rates of degradation of nutrients, increased excretion, altered metabolism, and redistribution of nutrients. So therefore, the disease has this effect on nutrients, which really affects the type of guidance or what our requirements are. Disease can affect whole body nutritional status, but it can also affect tissue-specific deficiencies. That is, the diseased tissue itself becomes nutrient deficient in the absence of whole body deficiency. And how do we address that with food? Sometimes disease can confer conditional essential nutrients, as we'll see in a moment, and can change or affect nutrient toxicities. Disease also affects our biomarkers of nutrient status. It can influence functional biomarkers and status markers in the whole body. But also, we have to begin to think about what are the markers we need to show or to understand tissue-specific nutrient deficiencies, such that many um, neurological diseases are associated with depletion of nutrients in the CSF in the absence of depletion in serum. And we need to think about predictive markers of disease. That is, what's going on in our stem cells? What are their nutrient needs relative to the re regenerative capacity needed during states of chronic disease? So some examples of factors that affect nutrient status and or biomarkers of nutrients include increased rates of catabolism. So there's something known as acquired ar arginine deficiency syndrome, where the enzyme arginase that degrades arginine is elevated in various different states of infection and disease, causing an arginine deficiency, and in fact, then resulting in a conditional need for more arginine. Inflammation affects the status of several vitamins. Whether or not this is a redistribution or a frank deficiency is an issue of debate currently. It can cause tissue, de there can be tissue redistribution and or excretion of nutrients like iron, B6, and, and vitamin D. You can have decreased rates of uptake across the gut or the blood-brain barriers we discussed. And you can have decreased rates of synthesis. For instance, serine is an essential amino acid for myoblast proliferation during muscle regeneration. We know very little about how to um, maintain optimal levels of stem cells, both their number and their health, in states of tissue regeneration. Um, that are needed either during or following disease. So at this, rest, at this workshop at the National Academies, we're going to be discussing what are the considerations for proposed standards for special nutrient needs. And we're going to need robust biological premises first. How does disease affect nutrient needs? Why are they different? What are the relevant biomarkers of nutrient deficiency in disease? And is nutrient intervention having a physiological effect or is it having a drug, an off-target effect? That is, is the disease actually causing a nutritional deficiency and you require more of that nutrient? Or are these elevated levels of intakes of nutrients that in some cases seem to be beneficial having off-target effects? We need good data for efficacy. Does increased intake address the nutritional deficiency? Does increased intake improve clinical outcomes? And 
what we mean by that is the, the disease-induced effect on nutrition isn't probably going to be related to addressing the primary disease outcome, but a lot of the comorbidities of disease may result due to a nutritional deficiency that's caused by the disease giving you the comorbidity. An example could be, for instance, a peripheral neuropathy in the case of diabetes, where diabetes may be causing a specific nutritional deficiency that then results in a neuropathy. And you can treat the comorbidity by addressing the disease-induced nutritional deficiency. And lastly, are we going to be able to classify clinical subgroups with distinct nutritional needs? So there's an appreciation now that if we are going to focus on chronic disease endpoints to set nutrient and dietary guidance, we're going to have to think about the whole range from health to disease, especially when you consider in the U.S. over half the adult population suffers or is being treated for some sort of chronic disease. So when we think about the dietary reference intakes, those are meant for healthy populations. And as you see now, we've added chronic disease endpoints, so we're really pushing from health deeply into primary and secondary prevention of those disease as we begin to set nutrient standards. But again, another half of the population may be in this disease management phase. And how are we going to set guidance for what nutrient conditions are in disease? And we're going to need different types of markers than what we use for health. We're going to have to think about tissue-specific nutrient status related to disease. We're going to have to talk about stem cell nutrition um, in terms of tissue regeneration. And we're going to have to talk about restoration of function. That is, as biological networks decay with age, what are the nutrient inputs that are needed to restore that function given the decay of the network to best support those? And so what do consumers need to know? And this is a big open question. Because as we know, data is becoming more and more accessible. People are not on their cell phones now, not only monitoring how many steps they're taking, but increasingly there are these technologies now I think we'll hear about today for point of care measurements, for chronic disease markers, for nutrient status. Consumers are going to have an incredible amount of information and how are we going to guide them to use that information for health? Are we going to be able to classify subgroups like we did for the mice for diets? And that seems unlikely because there's not a lot of inbred humans around. But with this data, people will have real-time data, and the data will be accessible. They're going to have both disease data, they're going to have their nutrient status data, and how are we going to have their cell phones give them then how to process that information for proper dietary guidance? Some of the work that we've been doing is working with Microsoft Institute in Italy, Cosby, to begin to build some of these metabolic networks feeding in all of the detailed kinetic and compartmentation and cell biology data into these networks, and then setting those up in a actual simulation and letting these runs for hours until they come into equilibrium, and looking at every point in this node, where are the most sensitive points in this node that actually affect nutrient inputs to make these networks work optimally. And so we're taking this network and we are making it as comprehensive as we can. We're putting in from all the genomic databases the ranges of enzymes, the ranges for all nutrient inputs, and then looking at system-level biomarkers as readouts. So we're doing sensitivity analysis with the simulation, looking at what changes in gene expression matter in terms of the function of that network, which ones decay with age, and then what is the dynamic range of nutrient inputs required under different network states, either healthy or aging, to maintain those optimal biomarkers of health. Um, and I just want to close by mentioning that this September we're going to be having the first international conference on precision nutrition, metabolomics, and public health and medicine. It's being held through Aegean Conferences, which is an organization that tries to bring more computer science um, and systems biology um, into issues of biology. Um, so we're going to be bringing together computer scientists and engineers and people interested in nutrition. So if you're interested, I can tell you more about that conference. So thank you very much. <laughs>